Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Schaefer's Market Mashup. It is Thursday, October 6th, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. VIX is above 30. Any other 30? I can't really think of anything else. Whatever. We're going to jump right into it. Uh, please welcome our guest today, Tim Knight, host of Trading the Close over at Tasty Trade. But he is much more than that. Tim, welcome. Thank you very much. You know, I've had this date circled for a long time, so let's jump right into it. You have quite the, the the background. It was very impressive perusing your LinkedIn and giving you a little lurk on social media. Apple intern, I mean, I, I thought I was hot shit being a Cincinnati Bengals intern, and here you are, an, an intern over at Apple in the you know in the late eighties, uh, founding profit. Your slope of hope stuff is amazing. What are some inflection points that occurred in your life that brought to brought you to where you are now? Well, uh, there's a bunch of them. I mean, it's I remember that uh, you've probably seen the movie Wall Street and Charlie Sheen's character, Bud Fox, uh, says in the Gordon Gecko's lobby how I'm paraphrasing, but something like uh, life comes down to just a few moments. This is one of them. And that is definitely true. Uh, the scary thing is you never really know when that moment is upon you. Um, like you mentioned the internship, for example. And when I was in college, you know, being an Apple intern was like the tippity top of anything any college student would could possibly get after they in the summertime. And um, because I'd written a number of computer books already in my teen years, uh, the U.S. Congress somehow found me and said, uh, "Our Office of Technology Assessment is going to be." surveying uh, the role of computers in education and we'd like you to be our student representative which i thought was pretty cool yes. and the exciting part yeah and when i went i saw you know i'm on this congressional committee this kid and um also on the committee was a guy named del yokum who was the coo of apple you know basically the number two guy mm -hmm. and uh could not believe that good fortune because i knew apple up down sideways and essentially um you know he uh he got me an internship lickety split. And so that was, uh, that was just a happy circumstance. Um, but there have definitely been some other big ones. And that, that, that was sort of a preface to one that took place at Apple because during my internship uh, and subsequent to that as a, as a uh, employee there, um, they gave me, the America Online contract. Now that sounds like a big deal at the time. Oh yeah, America Online was this little startup that they just didn't want to deal with. And if it's any, um, if it's any representation of how unimportant Apple viewed America Online is the fact they gave an eighteen-year-old or a twenty-year-old responsibility for this relationship. Uh, so I met with. Steve Case, who, you know, ran the place, um, which was very small at the time. And um, we were doing a deal with them. But some years later, when I started um, Profit, this was like a year into it, um, I was trying to find some kind of clients for us. And it occurred to me to write to Steve Case, which, you know, by 1993 was much larger and more successful than it had been when I was at Apple. And, but he remembered me and uh, he got me plugged into the right guy. And that relationship, which is built on a prior relationship, uh, led to a lot of corporate clients, which ultimately really made profit what it was. And so, you know, it is terrifying when you uh, tiptoe back to the inflection points of your life and realize that if this one thing had changed, how utterly different everything would be. I mean, there's there's nothing important in my life that's ever occurred uh, without it, some happy accident. I mean, whether you're talking about my marriage or my, uh, hmm. my jobs or my, my business, what have you. Um, uh, I, I, I've got others. If you want a couple, if you're interested, you know, you, you lead the way, but I've, I've got, uh, I've got more stories than a grandfather. So, uh, I can go on or, or change the subject. You tell me. Well, I mean, it seems like you made quite the impression. First of all, you're, you're way too humble. Uh, I, I I'd love to, focus more on like the 
you know, how you went from slope of hope to tasty, because how did you basically hmm. integrate charting into yeah. your, your tech expertise? Well, charting for me goes back to uh, the very beginning of the first time I had any money to trade at all, because uh, I am, it turns out, a, a very visual person. Um, and it's funny, too, because I've always been fascinated by artists, and I always blamed it on being incapable of creating art myself. Uh, and that that's probably a lot of truth to that. But I am very visual to a fault. And I discovered quickly uh, in the mid 80s when I first started dabbling around in stocks that charts were definitely the way to go uh, for me. It just made sense to me. It felt right to me. And, um, you know, my, my, the first charting platform I created was with Profit, so not so cleverly named Profit Charts. Um, and after we sold Profit, you know, I just I skipped over 13 years there by saying that. But so 13 years later, we sold Profit um to ameritrade and uh i don't deal with boredom well at all and uh i, and I was like senior vice president of ameritrade and it's like <laughs> you know, the last thing i wanted to be um so after sitting around doing nothing for a while um you know my wife uh, suggested you, know, you should start a blog which as with all good ideas she's ever offered me i thought was really stupid and, um, you know, it's just a, a fad. It, it'd be sort of like in 2019 saying, you know, let's make, let's do a white paper and make a crypto coin. <laughs> it, it was just something really tiresome. Like everybody's doing it and I don't have anything to write about. Blogging does have a, a, a certain connotation that is sometimes difficult to overcome, I feel like. What, what, what has a connotation? Blogging. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that, you know, it's funny too, because... <laughs> I've made it my mission in life for no one to ever refer to Slope as a blog anymore because that, that's how it started. But Correct. It, it, like, uh, it outgrew that quickly. But back in 2005, um, and I think March, I want to say March 26 was the first day I wrote it. But you know, I told her I don't have anything to write about, uh, said the person who's written 33,000 posts since then. <laughs> um, and uh, But you know, just to placate her and give it a shot i i tried it and it you know uh literally approaching 17 solid years of um of doing this doing the what used to be called a blog i i get the jitters and having used use that word because i just i don't know i don't hate the word blog it's just that what slope has become has has sort of dwarfed all that but my point in all this is that an offhand remark by her about hey give this thing a shot uh, turned out to be like what would be my livelihood like from 2005 forward. Great. So moral of the story, cheers to your wife because she pushed you in the right direction. Well, every, yeah, everything that's everything good that's ever happened to this family is because she had an idea. So okay. uh, on my deathbed, I'll realize just to listen to her, but uh, probably too late. Is she standing over you now? Just uh, hold, you know, holding you at gunpoint, making sure you say that. Well, no, because first of all, I'm talking about her, which she would never permit. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, <laughs> and secondly, uh, I, I tend to sing her praises when she's absent far more than when she's present. So, um, but yeah, she, she's she's kind of the uh, the Forrest Gump of this movie. You know, always at those key inflection points without even really knowing it. I mean, that's that's a talent. That is that is a serious talent. That's not luck. So, shifting to your PC programming experience. You know, you're in the options trading industry now. Um, where do you see? Well, well, first, I guess backtrack a little and explain a little how the PC enabled the options trading industry, and then where do you see it going next? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was interested in options early on um, because you know, for the, for the same reason most people most young people especially get interested it's like oh i can make big percentages with a, with a small account you know that, mm -hmm. that's always the the allure and in the late 80s um it was funny because the uh the op the, the the options market and the ability to trade options the ability to to analyze was uh very primitive compared to what we have now and i remember so well in investors business daily 
this full page ad ran all the time from TBSP, the better software people. And the ad was simple. It showed this giant, giant um, kind of a table illustrating that, you know, if you had only used our product and bought and sold these, you would have turned this 10, it was, it was always absurd, like this $10,000 account into 43 million. And they showed all the trades. And in the back of your mind, it's like, uh, that's, you know, outlandish and too good to be true. And, uh, but it was hard to resist. It's like, wow, look at that, look at the growth. And it's very exciting. But it was always an arm's length relationship because the idea was like you buy an application and it says, you know, you just wait for it to say, do this and you go do it. Um, and I remember those days also like the, on the only options brokerage uh, that I saw and they would advertise was uh, Benjamin and Gerald, which conveniently was like Ben and Jerry. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I would call, you know, I would call the place of trade and like Ben or Jerry would answer and then you would tell them what to do. In fact, just as a sidebar, you know, what goes behind the scenes, um, take it from somebody who's been in tech for a long time, what goes on behind the scenes would disappoint most people, no matter what the technology. Um, and I remember so well, E-Trade started here in Palo Alto on California Avenue. And I would uh, go over and what would happen was that, you know, some person would be like on CompuServe and they would enter a trade with E-Trade and assume like some computer with lots of lights would be dealing with that. All that happened was that it like printed it out on a dot matrix printer and, you know, Bob would tear it off the printer and he would go punch, punch, punch on his keyboard and type in it. I mean, it was, it was exactly like placing a phone call, except slower. So that, that was the breakthrough electronic trading at the time. Um, not sure how I forgot on the tangent, but uh, I, I think I was just talking about uh, early, early computing stuff. The, the sea change was just taken place is that uh, I think a couple of things. One is the, obviously the tools and the technology are, are vastly superior, um, making for much more efficient markets, much more choices as to what to trade, how to trade. The education's much richer and deeper. Um, I actually, you know, on kind of a one to 10 scale of like options, knowledge, sophistication, trading style, uh, I probably would give myself a two and, and that's probably generous uh, as opposed to Tom Sosnoff with and Tony Batista, like 10 kind of level, because, you know, I've been doing this forever uh, and I am very deliberately simple minded when it comes to like what I'm actually uh, trading. So, um, you know, all the Greeks, I mean, people can ask me the simple stuff like, you know, what, what's your Delta? And, and it's like, I don't know, you know, it just doesn't, <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I'm a, I'm a simple chartist. It's really oh, very, very Zen-like. That is music to my ears to hear that. Wow. Um, in, in no disrespect to Tony, who's been on, who's a friend of the program and, and same with Jamal. Um, mm -hmm. In regards as a follow-up to keeping it simple with charting, what are some common misconceptions you see retail traders make today? Well, I, I, uh, I guess there's a misconception on their part, a misconception on, on my part. On their part, I think that they, they uh, equate complexity with efficacy. And I, you know, it's funny because people always ask me, you know, why does Tom hate charts so much? And how can you even have a program if Tom despises charts so much? It's like, you know what? I hate charts too. And this has been, you know, I, my life evolves, it, it rotates around charts. My life is all about charts. But what, what I, the charts that I claim to hate are those that you usually see that are just chock full of stochastics and RSI and MACD and ribbon studies and uh, all the, um, uh, the programmatic languages centered around signals. I mean, it bores me to tears. I, I want uh, as clean, simple to chart as possible. And it's not out of abject laziness. I simply think, I mean, I the, the, the clumsy expression is like, it has to sing to me. And I'll know a good chart or a good insight when I see it. And they never uh, are slathered with uh, all sorts of colorful mishmash, even though I've built all that mishmash into my own product. Um, any chart that you look at amongst the thousand or so that I follow, you know, has nothing more than maybe a few trend lines, maybe a few horizontal lines, 
perhaps a tinted area here and there to denote a pattern, be it mm -hmm. a top or a bottom. Um, but you will see zero indicators. Um, you will see on occasion when they work, uh, Fibonacci retracements. Mm, that's, uh, I, was, I literally had that written down because I was going to ask you about that. Right. And literally out of a thousand plus charts, probably more like 1500 that I, that I uh, follow, one has a uh, sine wave on it because it works. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, uh, so I, I think that people just get dazzled by this, this um, uh, Fantasia on their screen. And using that, I mean, you can make any argument. So, I mean, you could you could give me almost any chart and say, make a bullish argument or make a bearish argument. And even though those are polar opposites, I could, I could do so. Um, so I would just, you know, in my own show, in my own books, in my own site, I've kept things extremely simple. The, the mistake on, on my part, um, and this has less to do with tooting my horn than it has to do with me not being a dinosaur, <laughs> is that um, there's far more uh, artistry and human interpretation of this than I think people assume. And for years, actually decades at this point, I've always got my, uh, I'm always looking over my shoulder at um, something that can do what I do. Um, I mean, just three days ago, uh, a guy who I respect deeply and who's very smart uh, came out with, you know, he announced that real soon now, which means probably in our lifetimes, but real soon now um, he's going to roll out his pattern finder and you know, it'll find all the classic patterns in any chart you look at. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, Oh, here we go. You know, it's uh, my days are numbered. And I looked at the patterns he found and so forth. And as with the hundred other times before that I've seen such things, it's like, uh, I'll be fine. Cause this is garbage. Uh, I, I, you know, it even surprises me how humans do it because even if you take a, a very simple pattern, like the classic, everyone was like head and shoulders pattern. Mm -hmm. um, I'll see what other people consider to be such patterns. I'm like, no, that's not even close. I mean, what do you, you know, get your eyes checked. So I don't, I don't claim to be able to do many things well. It's probably a sheet of paper with one item on it. But uh, mercifully, I think that um, I, I'm, I'm okay for now with respect to being able to, to do this stuff. What, as far as keeping it simple, what, what, what is your relationship with moving averages? Because I, I'm tearing on love and hate because like you said, it can be molded into whatever argument you want to make. Yeah. Uh, I don't use them. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I suppose with slow moving items, like, you know, everybody's classic 200 day moving average and such, mm -hmm. it helps provide you some kind of framework uh, around the price but to my eyes, it's just noise. It's really just noise. And you're uh, corrupting the information in such a way that, you know, I, I think the, the conceit that goes with indicators is that there is a certain truth under the surface that cannot be revealed by the simplistic presentation of data there has to be some mathematical magic that goes on behind the scenes and you will be revealed with this winning formula. And every successful, sophisticated trader I've ever interacted with, will, the, the, I mean, they, they'll blaze it in gold. There is no holy grail, none. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think it depends upon the way a person's mind works because, um, you know, I, I can't explain Tom's... Uh, discomfort with with charts but i can certainly explain my discomfort with what he does with probabilities and greeks and so forth because my mind just isn't wired that way it doesn't mm -hmm. uh it's not geared that way uh and so uh a person who's a systems trader or who's very good at indications and such they may do fantastic with that and god bless them i mean i used to work for you're probably familiar with the book market wizards um which is uh, profiles of all these very successful traders I used to work for one of them. And back in the early 70s, uh, he just set the world on fire with his success, like in the sugar trading pits, with 
a laughably simple uh, moving average, you know, like on punch cards that he would use. Um, but in those days, you know, in terms of like a technology arms race, nobody was doing anything. So in his instance, um, having like a 15 slash 30 day cross uh, crossover system was like putting a man on the moon. Yeah. So um, like I say, I, I certainly don't want to like wave my arms around and say the indicators are all to be ignored. Just for me, uh, they, they've never resonated with me. So I just don't, uh, don't use them at all. Would you say it's more of an, or I guess charting in general is more of an art than a science? Oh yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a book um, that I forget the name of it, but it sort of broke my heart, but the, the book's essential premise was let's find out if technical analysis works or not. And uh, you know, they try to take a very scientific approach and they had all the classic patterns and ran the, ran the, uh, the numbers and uh, you know, success failure. And in the end, it essentially said that, nope, doesn't work. Uh, so it was basically a damnation of this, like, you know, you will do worse if you, uh, if you follow this, but, um, to, to my eyes, um, it is a one style of worldview, which needs to be integrated with other worldviews to come to kind of some sort of conclusion. So for example, I'm very interested in. Uh, politics. I'm very interested in international relations and mm -hmm. uh, history, and and uh, kind of the broad cycles of history. You're talking uh, to you're talking to a liberal arts double major, history and international relations. So you're you're singing my tune. Well, that there you go. Because see, in college, I was an idiot. I, I majored in marketing, which is just absurd. What a waste of time. Uh, I think that uh, uh, what you did is is the right approach, and. Um, I, uh, when I look around the world, um, I try to understand as best I can, uh, the federal reserve and their nature, what they've done, what history is telling us where we're going, uh, as a society, as a nation, where we, what our place in the world is and so forth. Now charts to me are a different expression of those same realities because at its most basic, the chart is the perfect representation of the balance between supply and demand for any given instrument. And it, 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 it really, it draws its own conclusion. And, and, and I found to, then also to be rather prescient, uh, charts seem to know what's going on before people do. Uh, you know, a good example I, I like to think of is back in the, um, before the first Gulf war, uh, which I think broke out August 6, uh, 1990. Um, if you look at the crude oil charts for like two weeks before that happened, because that was a surprise attack, mm -hmm. you could definitely see something was up because the volume grew substantially, the crude oil prices strengthened substantially. And even though this was like a bolt from the blue on August 6th, if that was the day, um, it seemed that uh, the, the sort of uh, hive mind of trading out there and therefore the charts knew what was happening. And so here you and I are talking on this day and in about um, in about uh, thirteen hours from now or so, uh, the jobs report is going to come out. Bingo! That, and that will almost that will that will have some big effect on the market. And it's kind of fascinating to watch because um, the instantaneous conclusion from that information often bears little resemblance to the conclusion at the end of the day and at the end of the next week. Uh, so watching how, again, sort of the hive mind processes that data uh, over the course of time is sort of fascinating unto itself. So this all began with a query about, you know, is it more of an art than a science? And I think it is an art in the same way that political science is an art and history is an art. Um, I don't use any programming of any kind, any sort of mathematical interpretation. It's all very squishy. Wow, that is I, I have never heard that before, and I love that. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, don't don't be surprised if you see that stolen. No, I mean, I'm not. I'm not pandering, though. This is really how I feel. No, no. I yeah. that's. I mean, you're 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 preaching to the choir here, and and I'm glad you you started to pivot into the current market environment that we're in now, in in the ecosystem for the fourth quarter. 
a- again, I know you don't want to give specific, oh, Tim says this, you know, or, or Tim. Oh, sure I do. Tim this. says this, uh, Tim says this for the past 17 years. There's nothing more I wanted. There's nothing more that I want than for people to hear what I have to say. So I mean, no, no compunction about opinions. Sweet. So then I'll just give it to you then. Are you more optimistic or pessimistic about the long-term prognosis of the stock market and especially as it pertains to the options market? Right. Okay. Well, um, let me ask, because I, I I will answer, even if you didn't mean it that way, I'll definitely want, I definitely want to answer that in terms of just the general market uh, uh, view. But when you mention options in particular, could you tell me what insight that you're after with respect to options? Um, short term stuff. You know, you, you see all these weeklies flying off the shelves. In, okay. So in, ter- in terms of either market direction or in terms of the options business as a business? Mm, let's go with both. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll answer the second one first because I'm the least qualified to answer it. Um you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The thing is that I, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of orig- I'm one of Tasty's original broadcasters. I mean, I, uh, I was involved with Tasty Trade when it was literally a domain name Tom owned years before it launched, and he was like, "I'm going to do something with this one day." You know, whether it's a cooking show or what. <laughs> so I, I've been involved right from day negative a thousand, uh, but uh, I am purposely ignorant of just about anything happening with tasty trade and the options industry in general it is to me astonishing uh that tom i mean for a person and tom did this with scott of course and woody uh and and um and christy uh for a person to have built and sold one brokerage successfully is an incredible achievement to do it twice is is, is unheard of Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's just it's just unprecedented, and so and you know God bless him because usually when somebody buys you, it's like you know you won't you know you're forbidden from this industry the rest of your life. So and he so he built this great thing, sold it, and built an even better thing, and sold that. Um, and I think Tom has the same relationship with boredom that I do. I just think he's a lot more ambitious than I am. Uh, <laughs> so, so in terms of uh, the options industry, I have now exhausted my knowledge there. Uh, in terms of uh, market opinions. Um, the query about optimistic or pessimistic is 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 uh, very loaded and subjective because uh, what it usually means, optimistic, is that you know the the market's going to go up and things will be happy, and pessimistic would be the market's going to go down and it's a bad thing. Whereas I'm just the opposite. I'm like a uh, dying in the wool, proud perma bear. And so if I'm optimistic, it means God help everybody else, you know? So <laughs> that, uh, that is a contrarian signal then. <laughs> yeah. So I'll try to, I'll, I'll use uh, absolute language as opposed to relative language. Um, so in absolute terms, um, and this is the, the good suburban Protestant coming out in me, uh, good Southern Methodist. Um, my view is that you cannot take uh, decades of Fed largesse, and in particular, the bacchanalia of trillions of dollars that have been foisted upon the world since uh, 2009, and even on on steroids from 2020. Mm -hmm. You can't take all that, $31 trillion in debt, and pay for those sins with a 20% drop in the market briefly. No. Mm -hmm. No, you're not going to do that. Um, my view is simultaneously uh, apocalyptically pessimistic and uh, joyously optimistic. And it depends on the timetable. So what I would love to see, because I love this country, uh, what I would love to see is an honest to God, screaming in the streets, we're all going to hell, bear market, that goes on for like, you know, a couple of years, not days or weeks, but years and gets people to the point where they like don't even want to hear the word stocks ever again in their lives. You know, they, they just despise the very idea. Um, they despise the Federal Reserve. They despise the stock market. 
and they just want to be safe. They just want to be secure and know that there's going to be food on the table. You know, um, the cleansing that takes place in these things goes in stages. Um, you are not going to have Apple blow up at the beginning of a bear market. You're going to have things like Virgin Galactic mm -hmm. uh, and Stitch Fix and uh, uh, all the other SPAC stocks and the IPOs that are in the past few years. You know, you could produce a list right this second of stocks that have gone down 95% or more and it would go on for pages. So there's already been tremendous devastation with junk. Um, Apple, Amazon, they're doing pretty good because, mm -hmm. you know, yes, they're down, uh, you know, 15, 20%, but they're doing fine, relatively speaking. Um, it's when people are spitting an apple's eye, then, you know, the, the, the bear mark is probably just about done. You know, I am right here standing in the Silicon Valley, uh, four blocks from where I'm standing, Mark Zuckerberg's house. Four blocks in the other direction is Tim Cook's house. Five blocks in the other direction is Marissa Meyer's house, which has the best trick-or-treating house in the neighborhood, by the way. Okay. Um, and I've got Sergey Brin, seven blocks in the other direction. So I'm surrounded by these lunatics. And the thing is that uh, this has been, you know, Babylon uh, with the, the sort of uh, tech success and so forth. And, you know, already uh, the tide has turned and uh, housing prices are uh, plunging. Uh, layoffs are uh, are happening every week by the thousands. Mm -hmm. uh, Pel and Pel Peloton today. Oh yeah, yeah. And um, you know, I think we were going back earlier to like the whole artistry and 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 the uh, the, the the tapestry of all these squishy elements. And one of them is just a sense of kind of moral outrage and revenge. Because when things are going really, really well, when everybody's doing well, um, there is a tremendous amount of forgiveness and overlooking when it comes to the sins of others or the excesses of others. Um, so if someone is making 60000 a year and they're comfortable and they just got to raise to 65000 the guy who went from $50 billion net worth to $100 billion it doesn't bug him, you know, because mm -hmm. everyone's okay. But when things are going south, uh, people get pissed off. And the worse things get, the more pissed off they become. And uh, I think we're going to see that expressed uh, in the years ahead. You know, look at, for example, the history of tax rates in the United States. The more pissed off people are, the higher they go. Mm -hmm. And so you get rates that I, I, you know, I think in America, I know it's much worse in Britain. Um, I'm pretty sure in America, it got up to like at one point run 90% or so. I mean, it's just basically confiscatory. Um, whereas uh, in happier times, everyone's very, very liberal and everybody loves, you know, even though very tiny percentage are super rich, everyone loves the super rich. And so you get this hero of the Zuckerbergs and the Musks and all this other stuff. You know, if this bear market goes on for say two years, Ain't no Zuckerberg on any covers anywhere. I mean, the guy's going to have to double his security detail. It's going to be <laughs> ugly, you know? Um, so there's all this, I mean, as a, you mentioned your interest in history and such, as an amateur historian, I find this all just fascinating. And I, I actually look forward to the next, the, the next 26 months are going to be bonkers. Uh, between the financial markets, between not just the midterms, but oh my God, the election of uh, November uh, 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, these are going to be gigantic years. Now, I began this whole excursus talking about pessimism and optimism. So the pessimism, so to speak, is that I think we're in for uh, a calamity that dwarfs everything that we've seen. And I think it's going to be so bad that even I will be freaked out and like not like it. And that's how bad I think it's going to be. What I'm hoping, the optimist in me hopes, hopes, hopes that through this cleansing process that America emerges a better uh, country than it was. Because the preposterous proposal of the build better back thing, and this is not this is not a political stance. I'm simply talking about from a cyclic perspective. What was preposterous about build better, uh, build back better, excuse me, is that 
the notion of like, all right, we're going to spend, you know, whatever it was, $6 trillion on like building roads and bridges and such. It's like, no, 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 no. You know, the age of excess, the age of infinite money, you that's ended. Mm -hmm. That's not how this goes. You know, that sort of thing can happen years later. Uh, that's when it's appropriate, not now. So in short, uh, I, I would love to see an absolutely cataclysmic global financial wipeout followed by um, normalcy and, and true organic, and I'll put those letters in boldface and underline it, organic capitalism. I suddenly yeah. had the urge to go watch the big short. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> no. Face to black. So yeah. I, uh, I, I was thinking the entire time when you're talking about, you know, you want blood in the streets, uh, paraphrasing, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reminds me uh, the Shiatsu massage, where, yeah. you know, they really, really dig into your body very hard and it's very painful. And some people throw up. And then after that, symptoms are cured. You feel like a million bucks. And that's, I'm, I'm, stealing from a quote from the office but that's what popped into my head well it's you know look i've had a good life i'm not i'm not some like you know navy seal guy tough dude uh etc however I, I am an observer of things and i'm a writer at heart i mean people ask me what i do and i usually just say i'm a writer because at, at its essence that's what i am i've written all my life i've written a lot of stuff and i write every day and writers are voyeurs and they notice things, hopefully. Uh, and I, I, I look and I see that it is human nature that if things are easy, if things are handed to you, it is not good for you and it's not good for society. I mean, just the other day, my beloved son was telling me about, um, uh, he, he's, he's quite young, but God bless him, he's insanely smart and he hobnobs with like the Silicon Valley luminaries. And he encountered um, a chap who uh, was involved with Palmer Lucky. Palmer Lucky is the guy who uh, created the Oculus Quest and sold it for like $2 billion to Facebook. Oh, okay. Um, and he, Palmer um, decided to give a friend like a mansion so that he and all his bro friends could create technology there or something. And so he buys this mansion and some months later, he comes and pays them a visit. And it's like, it's like Animal House. There's just crap everywhere. They've completely trashed the place. They're just like, you know, dilettantes. Oh, and, he's just like, and he's like, shutting it down. Everybody out to get the hell out of here. This is out, 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 out. This, is, this project is over. Because these guys, who I'm sure were very intelligent, uh, if, 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 if you have, in a broader sense, when you look at Google and Facebook uh, and these other giant companies that were hiring like mad until recently, uh, particularly with what happened with COVID, you have a situation in which if, if you manage to get past the interview process, if you get hired, you're obviously very smart. Well, you're very young, you've got a six figure salary and you really don't have to do much mm -hmm. and, except for go to the really cool parties they throw. And so you had this, this mass of 20 somethings that were like, God bless direct deposit. And that's really all I got to worry about and just kicking it. And, uh, and by the way, I don't even want to come into work anymore. Uh, you know, cause you know, after COVID was well done, the boss is like, well, fellas, you know, can you come back in one or two days a week? Nah, I like it here at home. And they've sort of had enough because when the Zuckerbergs of the world, you know, lose like $50 billion of the net worth, and their stock's like worth half of what it was before, and their business is obviously deteriorating. Dealing with a bunch of darlings that want their huge salaries for doing nothing and hang out at home, that gets old. And so they're starting to like get out the machine guns, just like, you know, start to trim. And my view is that this is just part of this battleship that's turning around that's very slow, but the changes will be inexorable. And you're gonna find with increasing vigor companies are like you know what we'd like to make a profit one of these days so out so that's in the valley here I'm, i think we're going to feel that big time and it's just beginning hey new season of silicon valley that's that probably could be it yeah <laughs> uh, so got to wrap up here i mean geez i could i could i could listen to you talk for hours on end if if, if i know you're a writer but you have a future in the podcast world 
Oh, God um, bless you. Thank you. No, uh, I, I, I'm a, I'm a chatty sort. And, you know, I, I hope I haven't put too many people like on death watch here, but I, I just, this is, I, I'm sincere in my opinions. I can no, at least, I, that. I absolutely love it. I hope the listeners do too. So Tim Knight, um, writer, but also host of trading the clothes over at tasty shout out Tony and Jamal. Um, but you have much more going on than that. So I'll give you the floor here as we wrap up, where can, listeners readers find you sure that is essential well if you're lazy just type tim knight and i'm probably one of the top results in google uh you are are. okay that's easy but for the for the more uh picky and precise folks out there my website is called slope of hope and if any of you are wondering what in the hell does that mean there's an old expression most of you know markets climb a wall of worry and slide down a slope of hope and so i'm kind of the latter uh, so slopeofhope.com and yes, all one word slopeofhope.com and you'll find all my stuff there. It's free. Uh, and if you're, if, if you'd rather not go through 33,000 posts, I would suggest uh, you go to the read menu and it's like best of all time. And so I've, I've tried to curate what I thought was some of my better writing there. If, if you sort of dig what I've been talking about, there's lots more, more articulately stated right there. Wonderful. Again, Tim Knight, thank you so much for coming on. I've, I'd love to do this again sometime. I mean, we, we could take this conversation in a thousand different directions, and you know, hopefully, we get a chance to do that. But uh, best of, uh, you know, best all the best to you, your wife, your family, and uh, let's talk soon. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I'd love to do it again. Wonderful. Take care, Tim. All right. Good night.